Hello, reform mythologist Nate Morgan Locke here to talk more about franchise storytelling. It's engaging, it's immersive, it's addictive, and it's making lots of money. Now, there are few franchises which feel less suited to the label, less suited to making more money for people who are already obscenely rich Jeffrey, Jeffrey Bezos. than the one composed by Catholic philologist and Beowulf expert, the beer-drinking pipe smoker, John Ronald Rule Tolkien. Now, I said in the last video that books aren't films, and we make a return to this simple but crucial point here. We need to keep remembering this because Tolkien didn't write a screenplay. Now, I'm not advocating for never turning books into films. It's fine. It can be done really, really well. It's just that turning books into films changes the medium, which changes the nature of the storytelling. Now, notice I didn't say story, although it might change the story, and if it does, people get angry. It's official. Amazon has f***ed up Lord of the Rings. And why wouldn't they? But it does change the storytelling. In a film or a television program, as a general rule, words are spoken rather than read. Unless you start with a floating space scroll, George Lucas, you cheeky what's it. And so the words are delivered by an actor or a voiceover artist, a person with an accent. I ain't had nothing to eat but maggoty bread for three days. I don't think he knows about second breakfast. Fly, you fools! Anyway, even if you are alive to oversee the book-to-film process like J.K. Rowling was with Harry Potter, the story is then being put into the hands of multiple cast and crew members who, interviewed about the project, may have political perspectives which differ from those of the author. That's right. The world of literature is not completely immune to these challenges because there are questions about who owns the text, the writer or the reader. We'll get into that later. But film and television is part of a media landscape in which everything is squashed into socio-political terms. When the religious or philosophical categories of the story and its meaning are disregarded, its primary value is as ammunition for a culture war. Algorithmically charged ammunition when the conversation wakes up and finds itself on the internet. But, my dearly beloved, I digress. We are gathered here today to think about the Lord and the Lord of the Rings. So in this video, I want to show you how Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings, why his world building gets such high praise and why it means so, so much to so many people. So grab yourself a little embus, wrap yourself in mithril and let's venture forth. In the last video on Harry Potter, an entirely uncontroversial topic, I made a point of raising the question of inspiration, or the backstory of the story. It came. And it came. Now, Tolkien doesn't get too much into this on the specifics of Lord of the Rings, but he does have a famous lecture-turned-essay called On Fairy Stories. It's essentially the closest thing you'll get to Tolkien's creative philosophy. Tolkien argues that the question of origins is a fool's errand. The history of fairy stories is probably more complex than the physical history of the human race and as complex as the history of human language. All three things, independent invention, inheritance and diffusion, have evidently played their part in producing the intricate web of story. It is now beyond all skill but that of the elves to unravel it. All right then, Tolkien, you keep your secrets. But he definitely thinks it has something to do with words and their power. Again, the incarnate mind, the tongue and the tail are in our world coeval. Ooh, coeval. That's a word to ponder when you're stuck in a long, boring meeting. Maybe a long and boring meeting in Rivendell, chaired by an elf whose name rhymes with hell pond or an entmoot. Hmm, coeval. Where were we? Hello, we're talking about language. Right, Tolkien proper loves language and words and grammar and stuff. Here he is in On Fairy Stories banging on about adjectives. How powerful, how stimulating to the very faculty that produced it was the invention of the adjective. No spell or incantation in fairy is more potent, and that is not surprising. 
Such incantations might indeed be said to be only another view of adjectives, a part of speech in a mythical grammar. Mythical grammar, Tolkien, you legend. <laughs> he continues, The mind that thought of light, heavy, grey, yellow, still, swift, also conceived of magic that would make heavy things light and able to fly, turn grey lead into yellow gold, and the still rock into a swift water. If it could do the one, it could do the other. It inevitably did both. Is anybody lost? I think he actually might be casting a spell. When we can take green from grass, blue from heaven, and red from blood, we have already an enchanter's power upon one plane, and the desire to wield that power in the world external to our minds awakes. If he is casting a spell, it sounds like it might be about to get dark. He carries on with the intoxicating power of adjectives. It does not follow that we shall use that power well upon any plane. We may put a deadly green upon a man's face and produce a horror. We may make the rare and terrible blue moon to shine. Or we may cause woods to spring with silver leaves and rams to wear fleeces of gold and put hot fire into the belly of the cold worm. But in such fantasy, as it is called, new form is made. Fairy begins. Man becomes a sub-creator. Given Tolkien's absolute delight in words and adjectives and mythical grammar, it's hardly surprising that he was not content with writing a mythology, but gave the creatures of his sub-creation their own languages. Now, if we're looking for the secret to Tolkien's success, we should notice that the Bible points to the same creative power of the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all men. J.R.R. Tolkien built his world from language. Words are the basic building blocks of Middle Earth. In one sense, this is true of all written work. If you want to write a story, you're going to need some words to get you started. Tolkien did much of his writing, reading, smoking and drinking with a group of friends known as the Inklings. Another member of that band of literary brothers was Clive Staples Lewis. He said of the Lord of the Rings that the utterly new achievement of Tolkien is the direct debt which every author must owe to the actual universe is deliberately reduced to the minimum. I talked about this in the Harry Potter video, but Lewis goes on to say, not content to create his own story, he creates, with an almost insolent prodigality, the whole world in which it is to move, with its own theology, myths, geography, history, paleography, languages, and orders of being, a world full of strange creatures beyond count. So story and world building. Tolkien was a sub-creator of remarkable depth, and his work feels genuine. You could say his work rings true. Thanks. Here's his reflection on the creative task. Probably every writer making a secondary world a fantasy, every sub-creator wishes in some measure to be a real maker, or hopes that he is drawing on reality, hopes that the peculiar quality of this secondary world, if not all the details, are derived from reality or are flowing into it. Look at this impressive diagram. There's the world in reality the primary world, the one you're in right now, eating your crisps and watching YouTube videos when you should probably be in bed. Please tell me you're not in bed. Well, if you are, please stop eating the crisps. And then there's the secondary world of sub-creation, a play world in which we're defeating Bowser, discovering who done the murder on the Orient Express, or threatening a king with a bishop. There's, there's chess and there's a game of chess. <laughs> Mark the difference for me. Mark it, please. In the primary world, we make our secondary ones. We make believe and make our mini myths and write fantasy books and soap operas and sitcoms. The secondary world is when we're inside them. They need the inner consistency of reality, as Tolkien says. And that's why there is always some correspondence between the primary world and the secondary one. If we're perpetually holding out for heroes in the world of make-believe, 
there's a good chance there's a hero in reality. It can also be described as the difference between what is and what if. Reality is what is. What is the best thing? The play is what if. Mark the difference for me, mark it please. Every time we make plans or fear for the future, we're engaged in a type of sub-creation. What if I grab my phone and see what's happening in the world? What if I click on this YouTube video? What if I eat crisps in bed? We'll come back to this what if, what is idea when we talk about politics and marketing later. Ugh, politics and marketing. Tolkien believes strongly that this work of making myths comes from humanity's creation in the image of God. He is the creator, we are the sub-creators. Mythopoeia basically means story making, taken from the Greek words for story and, yes, you've guessed it, making. Mythopoeia is the craft of making a story and yet, while we're all about the franchise storytelling right now, myth making isn't such a popular term. Instead, people like to talk of world building. 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 The move away from mythopoeia and towards world building is significant. We invite people into our secondary world to play among themselves and keep the mythos to a minimum. This will be more relevant shortly. I'm told this is pretty key to the success of video games. Now, it's very difficult for people whose only experience of video games is Candy Crush, Angry Birds, or Tetris, because they struggle to see how anyone could become fully immersed. All right, those games are addictive, sure, but there's very little by way of world building and no real story at all. However, there are apparently things called open world video games, and some of them are very much about the story. But don't quote me on that, because as I say, I don't know anything about video games. I repeat, I do not know anything about video games. Willing to learn, though? Leave a comment below. Nerdwriter is a megastar YouTuber, and I'm sure he knows loads about video games because he makes fascinating high-quality video essays about all kinds of topics. I've enjoyed his videos on the paintings of Caravaggio, the films of Alfred Hitchcock, the songs of Bob Dylan. I'm a big fan of his channel. But back in 2015, way back in history, he made a video about Tolkien's world building that got me, well, feeling a little itchy. Now, it's been viewed over a million times and has over a thousand comments, and so I'm not the first to take issue with any of it, but I'd just like to, for a moment, here. Discussing the world building of fantasy writers such as Tolkien, he says this. World building in this view assumes a passive reader. It envisions a writer who photographs a secondary world, encodes it into language, and a reader who receives this immersive experience like a film, blissfully and perhaps willingly unaware that the world he experiences is a rhetorical construct. The only problem is that all these assumptions are based on false premises. You can't encode the world in language. Readers are never passive. They create the text as much as a writer does. Nope. No, they don't. That is not true. Since Tolkien died in 1973, I can safely say that no one watching this video created The Lord of the Rings. Those of you who have read The Lord of the Rings certainly did expend a certain amount of mental energy imagining the world that Tolkien created. Readers are not entirely passive. But none of you, lying there eating your crisps in bed, created The Lord of the Rings. I hope that's not too disappointing to hear. You may write fan fiction. You may play Lord of the Rings video games. You might TTRP or even LARP with the best of them but you didn't create the text as much as Tolkien did. In that same Nerdwriter video, honestly, I do actually feel a little bit weird critiquing him because I really did appreciate so many of his other videos. He seems like a very nice guy and uh, he's also got quite a nice voice and, and he doesn't do that vocal fry thing, uh, which he obviously could do, but he doesn't do that. Anyway, in that same Nerdwriter video, he talks about politics and marketing as world building. You remember the what is and the what if? He was keen for people to resist passivity. Fine, but he just takes it 
a little bit too far. The false fronts of the fantasy we were born into, the world that was built without our consent. Eesh. Now I'm all for consent, but there are a whole bunch of things that I never gave my consent to, but without which I wouldn't be here to, well, you know, give my consent. We live in a world built without our consent, and we can rage against it or retreat into a secondary one. But we still live in a world built without our consent. We also live in an age of expressive individualism, which arguably means Nerdwriter's view is winning. Advertising bends over backwards to ensure that by buying their products, we get to express our identities and live in a world built with our consent. But there are some things that are just given, like gifts. The Lord of the Rings is a gift that Tolkien was generous enough to share with us. Lewis described the deep need to submit yourself to the story in order to appreciate it, to allow the art to perform its enchantment. The first demand any work of art makes upon us is surrender. Look, listen, receive, get yourself out of the way. There is no good asking first whether the work before you deserves such a surrender, for until you have surrendered, you cannot possibly find out. So it really is quite important that we submit ourselves to worlds built without our consent if we're going to have anything to say about them. Thing is, I don't think Nerdwriter actually lives like this. He's far too appreciative. In fact, I don't think anyone can live this way consistently. We want to live in a world built with our consent because building your own reality is absolutely exhausting. The question is whether we can trust the author. How's about that for a segue, hmm? Nice. <laughs> Nerdwriter makes the case for politicians, advertising executives, and who knows, even film executives appeal to the what if. If you vote for me, buy this product and watch this content, life would be better. The world will be better. It's really all about the stories competing with their inner consistency of reality. Do they correspond with what is really there? So can we trust the creator, the author of reality? We make a return to story. The mythos of the mythopoeia. Here's Tolkien again. It is the mark of a good fairy story of the higher or more complete kind that however wild its events, however fantastic or terrible the adventures, it can give to a child or a man that hears it when the turn comes, a catch of the breath, a beat and a lifting of the heart near to or indeed accompanied by tears. As keen as that given by any form of literary art and having a peculiar quality. Even modern fairy stories can produce this effect sometimes. It's not an easy thing to do. It depends on the whole story which is the setting of the turn, and yet it reflects a glory backwards. The other major concept to come out of Tolkien's essay on fairy stories is the idea of eucatastrophe, which you'll be pleased to know has nothing to do with Brexit, but comes from the prefix EU, meaning good, and the word catastrophe, meaning, yes, that's right, catastrophe. A good catastrophe. A happy ending, if you like, that was surprising and yet somehow retrospectively inevitable. So it's something more than the resolution of the story and the tying up of loose ends. It's the ultimate tension and release, or the peripatia. My apologies, Tolkien was a philologist. We've already mentioned this. He loves those wordy words. <laughs> Peripatia is an Aristotle sort of a word, meaning the turning of the tables, literally the fall around. The turning point when tragedy turns to comedy or comedy turns to tragedy. On Fairy Stories concludes with an epilogue. Tolkien shows how one myth undergirds all the others. It has long been my feeling, a joyous feeling, that God redeemed the corrupt making creatures, man, in a way fitting to this aspect as to others, of their strange nature. The Gospels contain a fairy story, or a story of a larger kind which embraces all the essence of fairy stories. He goes on. The Gospels contain many marvels, peculiarly artistic, beautiful and moving, mythical in their perfect self-contained significance, 
and among the marvels is the greatest and most complete conceivable you catastrophe. Conceivable! Look, okay, if you didn't pay any attention to this video so far, but you're a Lord of the Rings super fan who is not yet convinced about the Jesus thing, please listen to this from Mr. Tolkien. This story has entered history and the primary world. The desire and aspiration of sub-creation has been raised to the fulfillment of creation. The birth of Christ is the eucatastrophe of man's history. The resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the story of the incarnation. So the key points in the primary world are Christmas and Easter. This story begins and ends in joy. It has preeminently the inner consistency of reality. There is no tale ever told that men would rather find was true, and none which so many skeptical men have accepted as true on its own merits. For the art of it has the supremely convincing tone of primary art, that is, of creation. To reject it leads either to sadness or to wrath. The Lord of the Rings. Please remember, media consumption is optional. You are under no obligation to read these books or watch these films or television programs. I'm reform mythologist Nate Morgan Locke. You've been watching Speak Life. I'm glad you were here.